Now I should be. Okay, so what we'll be looking at today, just an overview, we'll have some general tips and thoughts on literature reviews. Then we'll talk about the search, how you actually do your search, your literature search. And then we'll talk about organising your resources. And finally, we'll talk about some of the services the library offers. Remember, if you have any questions, you can just type into chat, just put them into the chat box and we'll see if we can answer them. Okay, just a quote to start with. The whole idea behind a literature review, if we go back to a quote by the famous scientist Isaac Newton in a letter to Robert Hooke way back in 1676, Hooke had asked him why are you such, basically why are you such a genius, why have you come up with all these brilliant ideas and he said if I have seen a little further than other men it is because I have stood on the shoulders of giants. So what you're basically doing in your literature review you are acknowledging the people who have gone before you in your subject area. They're people who've already done the work that you're going to build your research on. And literature review is you're going to present what others have done before, what the extent of the knowledge in your area is so far, and then you go on to add your, your part, your, your new section of knowledge to that area. And in future, others will build on what you have done. So when you're doing, effectively, when you're doing research, you are standing on the shoulders of giants and in future people will be standing on your shoulders. So stand firmly on the shoulders of others by searching widely, by doing the best possible literature search you can, by finding the maximum amount of information you can and by adding the maximum amount of the body of knowledge that you can. Your literature review may be one of the biggest information searches in your life because when you start out on a piece of research, a thesis or a major major report or something like that or you're writing a paper for a journal, obviously you're dealing with an area which you know something about but you have never before in all probability looked as much information as possible, looked for as much information as you need on your subject. You may have an idea of what your subject is, but you need to know as much as possible about your subject. So you need to cover the whole breadth of your subject. So this may be one of the biggest information searches you've ever done, okay? When you, when you get on to actually doing your thesis or whatever you're doing, you're gonna be doing an information search, but in a sense, what you've already covered in this search is the extent of the information that you're going to cover in your thesis. So what do you need to know? What do you need to find out? You look at your question, your research question, you have a look at it and say, well, what, what areas do I need to cover? If I look at my research question and say, okay, I've got A, B and C in my research question. It covers three separate areas of my research. I have to cover them all. Why do you need to know it? You may think, you may look at something, some aspect of your research, some aspect of your research question and think, do I really need to know that? Do I really, do I really need to know that? So the essence is to get what you need to know, but don't go any further. Don't get stuff that's irrelevant to what you're looking at. So what is the purpose of a literature, literature review? You're providing an overview of the following. What's already been said on the topic? This is why you need to make your search as wide as possible. You need to cover everything relevant that's been written about the topic. If you're going to do any decent research, any piece of research that you hope you know, will be worthwhile, a thesis, a major report, a journal article, you need to know as much as possible about that topic. So you need to know what's already been said on the review, on the topic. It's a to literature review. So you're reviewing the existing literature on a topic. Who are the key writers? One thing when you're doing a thesis, for example, you'll come to know who the key writers are. These are the people whose names will turn up again and again in your research. Not only will you be reading all the stuff they've read, but they'll be turning up again and again because others have cited them. So you'll soon get to know, there'll probably be, I don't, can't say for everyone, but in my case, when I was doing my PhD thesis, 
I quickly identified half a dozen key writers. These were the people who'd written consistently and frequently on my topic, and they're the ones who populate my bibliography over and over again. So it would be the same for you. What are the prevailing theories and hypotheses? What are people actually saying? What are their ideas? What is the current thinking on this topic? So you need, once again, you need to cover the whole topic. You need to cover as much, find as much information as you possible. You need to get an idea of what people are thinking. What's the current thinking on this topic? Is there a central idea that everyone, that everyone believes in? Or are there people on the outliers who say, no, I have a totally different idea. I have a totally different idea about how this works. You need to encompass all of them. What questions are being asked? What questions are people asking? You look at a magazine article, suppose there's a, your topic, it's been around for 100 years or something. Are people still asking new questions about it? Has it stagnated? Is there an area where you know you can break in, you can break in, you can come up with a new question? Okay, if you look and see someone's already asked that question, okay, I move on and I might see a new, new questions that I can ask. I can make a contribution to the topic. And what methodologies for doing your study are appropriate and useful? What are the methodologies other people have used? Which ones are appropriate and useful? There might be some you might discard. I don't want to do those. There might be others to look at. Yes, I can use those. So you need to, you need to cover all these areas when you're doing a literature review. So I basically, by putting it into a nutshell, you want to cover the whole subject. You have a topic, you want to be the master of that topic. By the end of you written your thesis, your report, your journal article, if you're really ambitious, you want to write a book, you want to be the absolute master of that topic. And you can't be that until you've worked out what the topic actually is, what it actually covers, the breadth of research that covers that topic. So this is your first step. I've heard people say, oh, a literature review, what a waste of time, you know, why do I have to do this before I actually start on the research for my thesis or whatever? But you can't do a thesis until you actually know the extent of what you're looking at. You're going to be doing 100, 150,000 word thesis or whatever. You need to know, before you can write a word, you need to know exactly what you're going to cover, exactly what's out there and what you need to cover. And it also allows you to demonstrate that you've read and understood the research in your area. So before you can really start on your thesis, you have to do a literature review. That shows your supervisor and other concerned people that you have actually read and understood the research in your area. You're not starting out from scratch. You've actually got a fair idea of what's going on in your topic area. You've got at least a beginning mastery of your topic area and that you're ready to start doing the real research. If you want more information on writing a literature review, the uh, Academic Skills Office, there's a website there that you can have a look at. Uh, so you'll be able to have a look and see what they say. Your literature review should place your research within a broader context. So if you're looking at one small area, you're looking at one small area of a topic, but there are wider areas that encompass that whole topic. So there are wider areas that are attached to it. So place your research within a broader context. This is what I'm doing, but these are outlying areas that also, uh, also affect my topic. You want to evaluate the implications of past research. You want to look at past research that others have done and evaluate, I don't know, maybe a few years down the track, how is this traveling? How is this working? Has this been overthrown? Has anyone overthrown it or is it still valid? Maybe I can overthrow it. Maybe if I'm really ambitious, maybe I can overthrow it and take the idea in a whole new direction. Identify research in related areas that is generalizable or transferred to your topic. One of the wonderful things I think with doing research is that you can get led off into tangents. It can also be dangerous, but you could be following one line of research and it leads you off to somewhere completely different. And you might look at that and say, no, 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 I don't need to go down this track. But maybe looking at that other area, there's stuff there that I can use or there's methodology there that I can use. And that's one of the best things about research is going off on tangents. You just don't want to let it get carried away by it. This is what you want to look for. <clears throat> you want to identify gaps in current understanding. When I was doing my thesis, which was actually, my thesis is actually on 
is in classics. It was on uh, Roman libraries. I quickly identified that no one in the past, no one has ever looked at how ancient libraries were actually lit. And I have, I mentioned that in my thesis, but I've branched off into an entire new field of research post doing my thesis, where I'm writing, uh, writing articles and uh, giving papers on this topic because no one else has done it before. So it's a very good thing if you can look for something like that, find a gap in the current understanding, and you might be able to deal with in your thesis, at least mention it, but then in future, you could identify that as potential for, you know, writing a paper or something like that. <clears throat> when you write a literature review, you become familiar with the research in your field. You're writing about it before you've even started writing your thesis or whatever you're doing, your report or your journal article. It ensures familiarity with the research in your field. So you become familiar with what you're looking at, it becomes second nature to you. Someone asks you a question about something in your field and you say, oh yeah, blah, blah, blah. Fred Blogg said this, 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 and this, and this straight away because you'll know your field, you'll know the research, you'll know what other people have done. Okay, and that makes you much more comfortable when you're doing your major research. Do you see how hard it will be to write a thesis or a major project without first having a knowledge of what's in your field? You'll be lost. It provides practice in critical thinking, initially of the finding of past researchers and then for your own work. If you come to know the field, if you come to know your topic, and after a while you'll think, okay, well, Fred Bloggs, he's written this, I don't agree with what he's saying, and here I've got evidence to say, I found evidence to say that Fred Bloggs is wrong, etc. So you become critical. Doesn't mean you have to, you know, tear them, tear, tear them a new one, but you can say, I believe he was an error, or made a mistake in this error, and I can do something better in that area. And also become critical of your own work. Because the more you know about your subject, you write something and then you look at it and say, no, 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 that's not what I wanted to say. And you'll go back and change it because you know your own work. Um, question, would you express that in your literature review? Yes, yes, if you need to, yes. Okay. If you feel it's necessary, yes. That will show you have command of your topic. If you have confidence in your literature review, if you have confidence in your literature review, if you have confidence in what you've found, uh, so far, yes, by all means say that, yes. How much is enough? There's no set rules. It depends on your research and the size of your existing literature. You might be studying a really niche area, one on not which not much has been written. Okay, if you do that, you're very bold and very daring, but the rewards can be great because you're setting off in a whole new direction that no one's covered so far. So that can be scary, but there's no, there's no set rule. If a lot has been written on your subject, then you'll have a lot to write about. Then you'll have a lot to put in your literature review. If you're writing on something that's no one's much touched before, if you want to chance out in that area, then you won't have much to say. It's simple. That's set by what you're looking at. Exactly, an obscure topic, if you do an obscure topic, might result in a smaller bibliography, simply because no one's written much on that. As I said before, uh, my topic that I'm studying, which is lighting in ancient libraries, my bibliography on that is practically non-existent, maybe three or four articles because no one's written those have only mentioned it in passing. So if you branch out into a new area that no one else has covered, your bibliography might be quite small, but that's not, that's okay, that's okay. If you have the courage to branch out in an area that no one's covered before, that goes with the territory. You are gonna create your own bibliography. Always remember to culture, consult your supervisor and follow their advice, because there may be something that missed. If they have a look at a draft of your literature review and say, okay, uh, there's some material by Joe Smith that you've missed, might be worth looking at. That will be particularly good if you've looked thoroughly at your subject area, but there might be material on the fringes of your subject area that might also be worth looking at. Your supervisor can help you with that. Start as early as possible. 
my recommendation is you start the day after the day after you've identified your your research topic even before <laughs> possibly even before you've enrolled to start studying to start doing your thesis or whatever the the moment you identify or give yourself a minute to think about it but say the day after the day after you've come up with your research topic start then okay you cannot start too early don't discard anything lightly if you find something but you think okay not very valid at this stage you might take a turn in your research you might take a turn in your research later in the, down the track and you say, wow, that article I found on day two, that's brilliant. That's just what I need. But where was it? So don't discard anything. If you put it in a different file, stow it away. This is why I talk about EndNote lately, later on. And EndNote's perfect for this because you can set up groups and group sets within your EndNote library. And you could set up a little file that says, uh, I don't know what you could call it. Uh, I don't know. What would you call it? Uh, uh, extraneous material or something like that just something where you file away things you've found that are mildly interesting might have something something that's you know if obviously if something's totally useless has nothing to do with your subject you can discard it but if material that you think might be useful in future if there's any chance that might be useful in future hang on to it okay now you want to actually do your search. You've worked out what your topic is. You've worked out what you want to, the areas you want to cover. So now you actually want to have a, you want to actually want to go and do a search. Analyze your topic. Before you do any searching, look at your topic. Look at it backwards, forwards, sideways, upside down. Look at it in a mirror. Put it on the floor and stand over it. Just analyze it. Get to know it thoroughly. Look at every word in your topic. Identify your keywords. Does anyone, you all know what keywords are? Keywords are in your search? If you look at a, if you look at a topic and it might have 20 words in it, for example, there might be four words in there that define what your topic is about. Obviously the subject of your topic and words that define your topic and words that limit your topic. Those are your keywords. Once you identify your keywords, determine synonyms and search terms from the literature. The literature you have found so far, have a look, see are there any words, say I have a word like livestock, just doing an agriculture example. Say my, in one of my keywords is livestock. Can I use other words like domestic animals or herd animals or something like that? Or animal production or something like that. Other synonyms, words or phrases that mean the same as your keyword. Just so that allows you to broaden your search. Topic, okay, here's an example. The impacts of insecticides used on tomatoes on the food chain. Now, if I look at that, straight away my keywords are insecticides, tomatoes and food chain. Those are my keywords. That's what I'm going to be looking at. Then there's a limiting word, which is impact. You want to find the impact of insecticides used on tomatoes in the food chain. So immediately, you know I'm going to be looking for insecticides, tomatoes, food chain. Okay. And I want to use impacts to narrow my search down. I want to use that to define my search. Okay, so there are your keywords straight away. Are you all familiar with Boolean operators? You know what Boolean operators are and or are not? These are your little words that help you to combine keywords to put a search together. Like if I put impacts, insecticides, tomatoes and food chains in a search engine, search engines are pretty stupid actually. It will say, oh, you just want those words. You just want impacts, insecticides, tomatoes, and food chain. It'll look for those wherever they turn up. Might have absolutely nothing to do with your topic. Insecticides, it searches for insecticides. It might find stuff on mortine and killing cockroaches in your home. Stuff on tomatoes might come up with recipes. Okay? 
guarantee if you put those four words in by themselves, you're going to come up with about 5 million hits and most of them are going to be completely irrelevant. But if you use Boolean operators like and or and not to link them together, so you want insecticides and tomatoes, you want them to appear together in the same article, for example, and you put in and, and the search engine will say, oh, you want them together. And it will find articles that combine those two words. So that's a start. There's still going to be a lot of hits. But suppose I have the opposite problem. I've done a search on insecticides and I've got nothing. I've come back with five hits. Okay, my subject is too narrow. So I want to broaden that. So if I put in insecticides, but also want to find stuff on DDT, on Claudane, I put in or DDT or Claudane. That will search for everything that carries the, all those words, that carries those words in it. So it will expand your search. It won't look for them together, but it will look for all of those words. So your search is immediately expanded. Sorry? DDT is a type of insecticide. It's now, it's now been banned. It was a insecticide. It was used after the war, popular after the war. They're just examples. Phrase searching, very important. I use this all the time. Suppose I want to, it's the most, one of the most powerful types of a search you can do. If I want to look for food chain, if I put in food and chain, even using and, it's going to look for food and chain in the same article and it can still be completely irrelevant. I want to find those two words together. So if I put them in inverted commas, it will only find those two words together when they occur as a phrase. That will, it's a very powerful tool. That will cut your search down straight away to exactly what you need. So if I put in food chain in inverted commas, straight away, it's like you only want those two words together, that's what you're going to got. If I put in food and chain, I could get 100,000 articles. If I put in brackets, food and chain, that could cut that down to a 1,000 or less. Okay, that is a very powerful tool for precision searching. Truncation, if you want to broaden your search more, uh, if you put an asterisk at the end, I want tomato, but if you put an asterisk at the end, it'll also find the plural, tomatoes. If you put an asterisk at the end, it will find all possible variations on the word you're looking for. So that will help you broaden your search. If I put in tomato and only find the word tomato and it misses the words tomatoes, I put in that asterisk and it will find all variations where the ending is different. So a search I could have, I could put together a search. I could have tomato with an asterisk. I would have food chain in brackets. So they want the fruit phrase food chain. And I put in brackets here. I put in a little sub search. I want and insecticide or pesticide. So that will broaden my search past just insecticide. Okay. So if you put the brackets there after the and with those two in there, it just creates a little sub search within the search. So once you get experienced, you can put together a really long, complicated search that was really precise for what you're after. So search strategies. The topic we have is the effects of bullying on education of teenagers in Australian high schools. So we've identified our keywords once again, Effects, bullying, education, teenagers, Australian high schools. Now, Australian is a good limiting word. Australia is a good limiting word because that will narrow down your search. You know you only want Australia. So if you put in Australia in your search, it will narrow it down to Australia. So we use and or. Truncation. Australia, finds Australian, Australia, Australians, etc. And we get a little search like this, bullying in education and a little sub search, teenager or adolescent to broaden our search. And we put Austral with the truncation there. So we find as many population, many variations uh, on uh, that word as possible. 
So our search will be, we're looking for bullying and education and teenager or adolescent, but we want to narrow it down to Australia. Are there any other keywords you can see? I would say effects. Effects would be a keyword because that's a limiting word. You are limiting the research that you want to do. Okay, you've got your search strategy. You know what you're going to search for. Where do you go and search? Where do you go and look? First thing, our library homepage. Okay. This is your one-stop shop for everything to do with the library. Your first put of call, come to the library homepage. Everything that the library has can be accessed from the library homepage. Library search. This is not a library catalogue. A library catalogue only contains physical items. And the library has about 400,000 physical items. Items are actually on the shelves that you have to go and look for. But we also have literally millions and millions of items which are available online. So library search is more than a catalogue. It covers items that are not only covers items that are not only in the library, but items that are also online. You can do a keyword search for relevant journal articles, books, book chapters, and reference works. So your keywords, you identify your keywords, you've made your search strategy, and you're able to do a search in the library search. Journal databases. Once you've done your library search and you've probably identified, I don't know, a few articles that you might want to look for and you found something, but you found them in library search, but you need more. You might have done library search and you think probably there's probably more out there. Well, the second port of call you've got is your journal databases. Databases are essential for postgraduate research. You're going to have to use them. You can't get by as an undergraduate. You can probably get by by using library search without any problem because your bibliography is probably only going to be maximum 20 to 30 items, perhaps maybe 50. But when you're doing postgraduate research, your bibliography is going to get a lot bigger and you're going to need a lot more information and you're going to need a lot more precise information. They can be more specialised. We have general databases, ones that cover a lot of topics, but you're doing more specialised research, you want databases that cover particularly specialised topics. So we have databases for that cover specifically things like agriculture, law, medicine, health, history, humanities, art, science, whatever. They also give you a chance to make more search refinements. You can refine your search. If you go to the library homepage, you'll see there's an A to Z list, database list, just below the search bar, and you can find all the little databases listed A to Z. Your subject guide is on your library homepage. We have a subject guide for every subject area that the university covers. And that will be like your one-stop shop, your uh, first port of call for all information relating to your topic. And it has a journal and databases tab. Stay current. Maintain awareness of key articles, key journals, key authors. If you're doing a thesis, it might take you, I don't know, four years perhaps. In that time, a whole lot of new articles could come out in your topic area, okay? So you could be starting your research and you've got a particular idea that comes out and all of a sudden, someone in the field produces a new article, okay? So you have to be keep abreast of this. If you Point, get your thesis, if you write your thesis 
and it finds out you've missed a key article that updates the information in your subject, then you're going to be, it's going to be, it's going to look, it's going to look strange. It's going to be a problem. It's going to be something that your thesis markers will pick out. will say, okay, Fred Bloggs wrote an article about this. I don't see any mention of it in your, in your research. Okay. So stay current, keep a lookout on any new material that turns up in your area. Many databases have alerts, for example. You can actually set up an alert for a particular subject and it will actually send you an alert saying, ah, a new article has come up relating to your subject area. Do you want to go and have a look at it? Library search, you can actually save a query. I've made a search. I can actually save the search I've made. ProQuest will save your search. Web of Science will actually create an alert. Mind what you find. Search backwards and search forwards. Okay, if I have a bibliography, I find a really useful article. I find this technique amazing. The amount of information I've found using this. If I go to the bibliography, if I find an article or a book that's really useful, first thing I don't even look. I don't even look at what the article contains. The first thing I do is I go to the bibliography. I go straight to the bibliography because there, the bibliography is this whole list of articles and books that the author of your article or book has used to write their research. And guaranteed, they're going to be on the same area that you're looking at. And you've got this whole, whole gold mine of articles without it doing any work. All you've done is find an article and you've got this whole gold mine of other articles and books that you can look through that deal with your subject. And you can carry that on infinitely. You can pick out an article or book from that bibliography go and search on it and then look at their bibliography and go from there. They call this snowballing because it just spreads out as you go and you can do it infinitely. It's going to take you a lot of time, but you are going to find valuable information by mining what you find. And then search forward. Get your article, go to a database like Web of Science or Scopus or something like that. Have a look at your article and find who cited your guy. The article you found, who cited him? Who cited him in their research? And then go and look at their research because chances are they'll be dealing with the same material that you are. Okay, so this is a very valuable tool. This is something you should do as a matter of course. As I said, when I find a book or an article that looks really good, I don't even look at it, read it. I first go to the bibliography. That's where I go first. <coughs> Excuse me. So check the authors, what else have they written, who are citing them, what headings or subjects are assigned. If there are any, if you're looking at an online article, it will often have the subject headings. So that will give you further areas to research. For example, an article there. So you can have a look at that, find useful keywords or something in there, or have a look at that article and lead it to you to other, the footnotes or the citations to lead you to other areas you can research. Does that then create an issue in terms of people always searching for the same things over and over again? Well, it does in a sense, but if you're working on a unique area of research, you know, if your research is unique to you, you're, you're doing a question, you're looking at a question in a unique way, you're trying to add you're trying to add knowledge to the subject area, it shouldn't really be a problem. Your, uh, your goal anyway is to find as much information as possible and whatever way you do it, whatever way you do it, you know, is effective. Reading up on methodologies is critical. Library search will help you find relevant works, the methodology of what you're actually going to do, the methodology of actually your research. Books are easy to find using simple keywords, i.e. qualitative research, quantitative research. This is research methods. 
some things you need to know about, how to find <coughs> how to find how to do research, the methodologies of doing your research. This is important. So if you do a book, or put in a book or a subject and you put in qualitative research, you can find uh, articles on how to actually do the research in that area. There is a website to help you with research methodologies, SAGE research methods. You just Google it, I haven't actually got a uh, URL here, but just Google search research methods, it's easy to find. There's a toolkit for planning research projects. It'll help you, help you to plan your research. Uh, it has links to books, dictionaries, and encyclopedias where you can find synonyms, example for your keywords. It covers methodologies. It has methods maps to show you how to map out your methodology and also has lists of major works on research methodologies. So you need to look at your research methodologies. Google Scholar. Google Scholar is a useful tool. Google Scholar has a wide coverage. Google Scholar can find lots of material. I found a lot of people here, the students that I've talked to, go first to Google Scholar before they go to anywhere else. Uh, in my view, that's wrong. You should be doing using library search and then databases first before you go to Google Scholar. If you're struggling to find anything, with library search or research or the databases, then go and have a look at Google Scholar. Our subscribe journal databases have search for features Google Scholar can't match. We can do searches much better than Google Scholar. Google Scholar's search methodology is very basic. If you want to construct complicated searches with phrase searching and Boolean operators, you need to do that on our databases. <coughs> Excuse me. For example, for doing major research, you only want peer reviewed articles. You only want the best material. And Google Scholar, although it does find good articles, it also finds a lot of rubbish as well. When you do a search on one of our databases, you can actually confine it to peer reviewed articles. So we'll only get the best possible articles. It also includes control vocabularies, uh, meshes, medical. Uh, subject headings, if you want to do a subject heading, it will give you subject terms to use. MESH is an example for medicine. There are other ones for other subjects. So it will give you subject headings to use, control subject headings to find material. Use Google Scholar primarily to fill in gaps. It may be that you are branching out into an area where there's very little research. You've decided to cross the dark sea, as someone once said to me cross the dark sea to go where no one's gone before. And you can use Google Scholar to fill in gaps just to help you to find links or leads for what you're looking for. Beyond using databases and books, we have other materials. Theses, all right, you're doing a PhD. Doesn't hurt to go and look, see what other people have done in similar areas, what other students have done their theses in uh, relevant areas. If you want UNE theses, you can find them at ePublications at UNE, and that is available on the library homepage. If you go up to the top where it says find, uh, hover over that and you'll see it comes up with a section for theses and you can find theses there. And we have, you can get links to Australian theses and international theses. Trove, if you haven't used Trove before, I recommend it. Trove, you can just find by Googling Trove. Trove is the uh, search engine of the Australian, of the National Library of Australia, and it's a free resource that lists a lot of material, and it does cover Australian theses and more. WorldCat is a massive catalogue of books and resources around the world. Just Google WorldCat and you can find international theses there and on the library homepage. Can you use um, these theses 
as part of your literature review or is certainly, it certainly if they're covering the knowledge you're okay. looking at all the knowledge that's in your area and if there's a thesis a thesis out there that has made some significant contribution to the knowledge certainly include it okay. they're a resource like any other your aim is to cover uh, cover as much of the of the knowledge area as possible so if they're if they're there and they're valid certainly use them okay thank you be organized. Record your search strategies. Now, if you're going to be doing a major piece of research, you're obviously going to be doing a lot of search, a lot of searches. And you might discard some searches because they don't find enough, but it's a good idea to actually record what search strategies you've done. If you're using databases, they will let you save your queries. They will let you save your strategies. You can build up a whole list of strategies. You might find it come to a point sometime months down the track and you thought, okay, I just need to go back to that search and just check to see if there was anything there or there was something there I remember I found in that search that might be valid. Go back there and look. Some disciplines, if you're doing a literature review, they may actually require a record of your search strategy. They may actually record your search strategy. So check with your supervisor. Individual databases may have the option individually. Library Search ProQuest will enable you to save your searches. And an overall record of searches will save you time because you won't be reinventing the wheel. If you've done a search once and it hasn't worked, you can look back and say, okay, I tried that search, didn't work, so I'm not trying it again. Okay, so you can keep a search, you can keep a list of searches you've done, you can do it, uh, keep a uh, Excel spreadsheet, for example. Just list what database you used, your search strategy, what your limits were, how many results you found, was it any good, anything like that. Just keep a record like that. It may sound a bit time consuming, but it'll help you in the end. If you're doing a long piece of research that may take you four or five years, it will all be helpful in the end. Organize your resources. Record details of relevant items straight away. Okay, this is where EndNote comes in useful. I'll be talking about EndNote shortly. So, got details of relevant items. A bibliography, your thesis bibliography may contain hundreds of items. You can't possibly memorize them all. You need to have a record of what you've found. You need to have a record of its basic details and also something that says this was useful. Oh, this was useful for this. This wasn't as useful, etc. Don't lose the source of a perfect quote. I guarantee you anyone who's done a thesis has spent time, they've come to a point in their article and said, oh, Fred Bloggs said something perfect. Okay, but where is it? How do I find it? You have no idea how frustrating that is trying to find the right quote. Coming from a classics background, where quoting what a classical author has actually said is so important, that can be so frustrating, I'm telling you. When you find a perfect quote, record it. Please, put that in huge red letters a foot high. If you find a good quote, record where you found it. God, it's going to save you so much heartache. Trust me. EndNote is your solution. EndNote is a software that we allow, we have you for you to download. For, have, have all of you got EndNote? You haven't got in. You haven't got EndNote yet. You've got EndNote. Okay. You've got EndNote. You've got EndNote. Okay. Okay. EndNote is the software we offer. You can download it where you manage your ref references and also. It allows you to insert citations in a Word document as you go. If you're writing your thesis, EndNote will allow you to put in your references automatically and starts generating a bibliography. When I was doing my thesis, I used EndNote, but I only used it, I didn't know about the other functionality. I didn't use it to store my, to, I didn't use it to actually, I only used it to store my references. So when it came instead of stupid, stupidly for me, instead of actually when I came to write my thesis, instead of allowing EndNote, to put the footnotes in and then the bibliography, I went to EndNote and I manually wrote out all my references from EndNote, which was stupid, complete waste of time. EndNote will allow you to write your document, insert your citations and your references as you go.
use EndNote properly, we have, after you've downloaded it, we have EndNote classes, both basic and EndNote. The basic one will show you what to do, basically, to show use it its, uh, in its most efficient sense. And then we have advanced EndNote classes. It will tell you not to do things like maintaining multiple libraries, which EndNote doesn't like, how to delete text without removing formatting, which can be also a problem because you have all sorts of field codes in at the back, not to use cloud because EndNote and cloud don't like each other, and it will also help you to send Word files to your supervisors. We recommend that you take one of our EndNote classes. EndNote has some great features, but take a class. You'll have fewer problems that way because it's a great piece of software, but it's not exactly user friendly. It requires care, time and care to use at its most efficient. And if you make major mistakes, they can be difficult, they can be difficult to fix. It's something, it's a great software program, but being a great software program, it's also complicated. It's only way it can do the things it can do is that it's, it, it has to be complicated. Software, if you're using, are you using specialised software? If you need to use it for your thesis or whatever, statistical analysis packages, computer-assisted qualitative data analysis, computer-assisted mixed methods research analysis software. Can't say that I know exactly what any of that does, but these are all things that you might need to use. If you're using, they might be necessary for you to do your research. Make sure you're getting the best out of it. Check library search for books and other resources on that software. If you need to use software while you're doing your research, make sure you know how to use it properly and make sure you're getting the best out of it. Innovate. These are software programs. Envivo is software for qualitative data. Helps you to analyze interview responses and look for connections if you're doing interviewing. It syncs with EndNote. What are the services we offer? Okay, you're having problems. You started out on a, a major research project. You're having problems. How can we help? We do interlibrary loans. You're postgraduates. Welcome to the magic world of interlibrary loans. You know that marvelous book that you couldn't get hold of because it was in another library maybe in another country and you couldn't get hold of it and how frustrating that was. Magic. Go to the library homepage, go to borrowing, go to the section on interlibrary loans. You say, I want to borrow this, I want to borrow this book. Just put in the details. The library will find it for you. They will get it and they will bring it to you and you can use it. Marvellous. If you have a journal article, you can't access the journal article. It's a journal we don't have, or it's long out of print. Do an interlibrary loan. The library will find the article and they will email it to you. Okay, this is a marvelous tool. We have subject guides for EndNote. So if you're having any problems with EndNote, before asking us, you can go and have a look at the lib guide, the subject guide, and find help with the problem you're having. And we also have a researcher support guide. If you go to LibGuides on the library homepage, we have a special one for researcher support. Take a library class. We have EndNote classes. Start off with a basic one. That will show you from scratch. That will show you how to set up a library from scratch. Then when you've got a bit more comfortable, take an advanced one. That will show you all the really fancy tricks to make your EndNote library work the best it possibly can. We have library workshops. We have workshops on searching. We have workshops on finding the best information. We have workshops on finding quality information, how to find the best information. And if you look at our library web, web page, where it says book a room or workshop, it will have a list there of class that are coming up so you can book in. You can book a librarian. If you're having trouble, if you're having real problems, you can book one of us for a consultation. 
If you have a look next to library search on the library homepage, you'll see book a librarian and you can book one of us for a consultation. So it can be the face to face, on the phone, online, whatever you want. We can save you time. We'll talk about your research. We'll suggest the best databases and strategies. You can also contact us by email, libraryresearch at une.edu.au, including questions on research data management. If you're doing data sets, if you have your uh, research involves data sets, uh, it's an obligation actually that you have to have your data sets uh, uh, saved in the uh, library repository. So we can help you with that. That brings us to the end. Does anyone have any questions on anything? Yes. 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 Right. So what, what do you want to save? You want to, uh, you want to save the resource. That's you save it in EndNote. That's, the, that, that's what you can use EndNote for, save the. Yeah, that's what you would set up groups. I, one thing I would do, when you add a record to EndNote, what I would do, you would go down, look at your research, look at your fields in EndNote and it says keywords, put in keywords, think of keywords. Like if you're doing a search on tomatoes or something like that, or pesticides, put pesticides in keywords or something like that will help you identify that article. Then you can do a search in EndNote and search for all the articles you have in EndNote or whatever, all the references that include that keyword. That's how you find it. The other thing you can do is create little libraries within your library. Like if you're doing a thesis, you could say group set thesis and then groups within that group set like chapter one, chapter two, chapter three. But you could also do it, your group set could be, I don't know, insecticide and your groups within could be DDT, Claudine or lists of other insecticides. You see what I mean? You can create little groups within your EndNote library and put all the related materials within those groups. And then you just need to look at that group to see what you have in that area. Excuse me, could you repeat the question that that person asked? We could not hear anything that they had asked. We could just hear your okay. response. Right, right. Yes, 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 yes. The question was just asked was, uh, if you have a massive amount of resources, you've got a massive amount of references, how do you find a particular reference again? And I was just saying that EndNote's a solution to that. You can either put in a keyword uh, to identify that article, you can search for it, or you put in groups and group sets. So you divide your EndNote library up into smaller, smaller libraries within the library. Okay. Yes. Where, where can't you download it from? Uh, you can't download it from a database. The only reason that would happen is if the article was one we don't subscribe to. All the databases should, yeah. You want to down, you found an article, you want to download it. Uh, Well, is an is an article that's not subscribed to. Sorry, I'm not I'm not understanding your question. Sorry, um, you found you found an article in a database, and it's not subscribed to. 
you don't find it in the database. Well, that's one. If it's only the abstract, it means it's not subscribed to. We don't subscribe. Maybe we only have a certain range of years for that particular journal. If that's the case, you can't find anywhere else, make an interlibrary loan request, as I said. If we don't have access to it, if we don't have access to it in our library, you can't get it, make an interlibrary loan request. That article will be emailed and sent to you. Someone just asked if you find an article in a database and we don't subscribe to it, that's what interlibrary loan is for. You can make an interlibrary loan request and they will find that article and they will email it to you. So make use of it. Go to library, try library search first, then databases, okay? And if then have a look at other things like theses and things like that. And if you find anything that you can't locate that we don't have, do an interlibrary loan to bring it in. Google Scholar, yeah, we don't, re we, look, no one, it's you, Google Scholar is useful, but don't make it your first port of call. I get lots of students that come in here and I say, what databases have you searched? And they say, Google Scholar, and that's it. It's, it's not, that's not the way to use it. Google Scholar is useful, but we have library search and we have library databases. Uh, not to be financially obvious, but we pay a lot of money for those because they are the best sources of information. It's a bit frustrating that students go to something free and which is not really suitable. Google Scholar is useful, but I would strongly recommend that you use our, our library materials first because they are best. They enable you to find the material, they have better search, search engines. If you've ever tried to search for something specific in Google Scholar, it's very frustrating because they have very few methods of searching, very few search refinements. If you are struggling, you can't find anything in library search, you can't find anything in the databases, then go and have a look at Google Scholar. Make it your one of your last ports of call, not your first one. We don't say don't use it, we're just saying don't make it your first port of call, okay? Okay, any more questions? Right, right, right. Well, if it's if it can't, if you go and search on Google Scholar, straight away you'll see on the right hand side, if it's got full text at UNE, it will say full text at UNE. If it doesn't, there'll be either a blank there or it will say something else. Like there's probably a PDF you can access somewhere. Certainly, go ahead and look at that. The only problem is. Those PDFs, you don't know where they've come from, you don't know where they've been peer reviewed, so be very cautious about using them. So if you do a search on Google Scholar, it will, it will, it will say full text at UNE, that's fine. Then you link on that, it'll take you to, the, to the, the item that we have in the library, okay? Sometimes it will say, oh, PDF at ResearchGate or something like that. That means the library doesn't have it, but you can still access a copy of it. Then again, you don't know where that's come from, it may not be peer reviewed, it may be suspect, you just don't know, it's up to you. So just be careful any material you find. Anything you find on Google Scholar that is not linked to the university, to our library, be careful with it, okay? Yeah, you can, that's what I said, if it has another access, by all means go and look at it. It may well be useful. It may well be attached to a peer reviewed journal, but on the other hand, it may not be. Uh, it's been identified that ResearchGate, a lot of them come up at ResearchGate. ResearchGate is somewhat suspect because it stores a lot of material that is not, not peer reviewed. You've just got to be careful. You've got to examine. We actually run, we actually do run workshops on looking at material for its validity, examining material for its validity, checking material that it's actually worth using, that it's peer reviewed. So I'd recommend you do one of our workshops on that and that will tell you how to find the best material, the stuff that's valid to use. Okay, are there any other questions? Okay, thank you for your attention. Good luck with your studies.
Uh, if you have any questions, don't remember, for, don't forget, contact us. You can ask us a question or you can book a librarian for consultation. So if you have any problems, don't hesitate to ask. Thank you. Yes, I can do that. I will do that. Yes, I will. Someone's asked. I will share the PowerPoint. I will share the PowerPoint through the uh, from the emails. Great. Yeah. Question. Sorry, before we go. Oh, okay. Um, so when you write in your keyword search, would yes. you put in, um, let's say, for example, tomatoes and, you know, fruits or whatever, and then put a comma and then start a different search section? Or would you just write it as a whole sentence? If you're doing a sub search, like if you're doing an or, or search within a search, I would put it in brackets because that makes it like a mini search within it. It's up to you. You can write it as a single long sentence. Uh, it just depends how the search engine interprets it. Uh, just as so long as you've got the right keyword, the right operators in there, it should interpret the way you want. But there is a case for putting in brackets, just so you can identify that this is a little sub search within your search. Okay. Up to you. One good thing you could do with searching is you can play around and see what works. So if you're doing something like a literature review, this is an excellent opportunity to play around with searching, to really get to know how to search. So do a lot of searches. You will do a lot of searches. Just play around and see what, what works best. Okay. Um, and also, I guess, what is probably a minimum amount for a literature review in terms of finding additional papers and evidence and so on? That depends on the subject you're doing. That depends entirely on the subject you're doing. If you're doing something that's a popular subject that's been well covered before, uh, you're going to find a lot of material. But as I said, if you're going to be the bold explorer, you're going to branch out into an area that hasn't really been covered crossing the dark sea, as I called it, with no maps, then the amount of material you might find will be limited. But that's the opportunity for you. This is the opportunity for you to make your own real contribution, to make your own real contribution. It will depend on what research you're doing, what area you're covering. So there's no, there's no maximum or minimum amount for your literature review. Just so long as you've covered the, the field to the best of your ability, you've found everything you think you can find on that topic, then you've done the job. Okay. Um, so, is it recommended to do the search prior to coming up with, I guess, your research question, just to test the waters to see how much evidence or information certainly, certainly. is on that topic, I would, I would, or I would, do you do it the other way around? I wouldn't do it. I wouldn't do it any other way. You need to do some preliminary searching. You need, if you okay. come up with a research topic, you need to like test it. As you said, test the waters to see what's out there. This isn't really part of your literature research. This is pre-literature pre review. This is, if you're doing a, it's, it's only common sense. If you come up with a research topic to just test the waters, see what's out there first. Just dip your toe. If you're going to cross the dark sea, just dip your toe in first to see if, see if the water is too cold or if it's nice and warm. <laughs> you see what I mean? Yeah. Okay. Um, also, does the library provide these, um, I guess, this support to verify whether the question is appropriate or well structured and so we, on and so on? We can assist with that. If you book a research consultation, we can have a look at your question. Okay. Uh, yeah. Whether whether your question is valid or not is really a discussion for your supervisor. But we can certainly assist. We can certainly assist with whatever you know, whatever in whatever way we can. We can certainly have a look at your question, and give you some ideas about where you might search and things like that. Okay. Thanks, Jane. No problem. Okay. Thank you very much, all. Goodbye. Have a great day. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. Lovely. No problem. And when Mike closes his window, we'll all be closed.